Open your Bibles, please, to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. That's a long time to be away from the culture. I think most of us have no idea um, what it's like for Pete and Jen, for the boys, to have been away all that time. As much as they love the work that they're doing there, um, re-entry is a big deal um, when you're coming back to the States. So continue to keep them in prayer. We're going to go a an interesting direction this morning, I think. We'll see where God takes us. Why don't we pray together? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we can come before you, Lord. You know our hearts, Lord. You know our needs. We want to lift up um, Pete and Jen, the boys, Lord. We ask that, uh, that you would continue to make a clear path for them. They've been following you for all these years, Lord. It's exciting, Lord, to have the perspective to look back at how you put a call on their lives in the first place, to call them to Ecuador. All that they have encountered, the things they've learned, Lord, it's exciting to see what you've done in their lives, and I know you're going to continue the work that you've begun in them, Lord. But as they they make plans for re-entry, Lord, we ask that you would open up opportunities for, uh, for a house, transportation, school, all those things, Lord, that you know they need. The things they didn't mention, Lord, um, the things they may not even know about yet, but you do. We ask that you would make the way clear. Lord, um, you know our hearts, you know our lives, you know the culture that we live in, the world that we're in, and how easy it is in one regard to call ourselves Christians. And we read passages like this sometimes, and I think for each of us, in one way or another, we, we wonder, what does this all mean? And what do you really expect out of me, Lord? So Holy Spirit, uh, as we walk through these verses, as we look at these directions you want us to go in the Word this morning, speak to us, Lord, about some of the deeper things of the Word that we don't think about that often. What you intend for us. Lord, in these last days especially, what it means to walk circumspectly, what it means to redeem the time, Lord, and to be the people of God you expect us to be, not to live double lives, Lord, but to live single, focused lives committed to you and you alone. Thank you, Lord, for, um, for what you're doing in this body of believers. We ask that you would continue the refining work that you've done, Lord, and that you would continue to bring the gospel into our community and also around the world, Lord. All this we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You and I have an enemy, and we don't think about him that much. Most of the time when we talk about the enemy, we just say, ah, the devil, ah, Satan. Um, And I just don't think that we think about him that much. And I'm not here to talk about him all that much per se. But if we could stand back a little bit, we've been in this study in Ephesians now for a couple months, and uh, I I, I think, as I I think back over some of my sermon notes, I always sort of say, well, you know, Paul has done this in the first three chapters, you know, and now we're into these next chapters, which is fine as far as that goes. It's important, you know, to be able to communicate those things. So Paul's done this in the first three chapters, right? He's talked about how God knew us before the foundation of the earth. We act like we understand that, but we really don't. But that he did. He knew us before the foundation of the earth. And that he called us to himself before the foundation of the earth. That he redeemed us. He's forgiven our sins. He looked down inside of us, past all of our failings and and, and, and all of our sins and, and all of our failures. And he's lifted us up and he's seated us. If, if there's a verb, there's a verb that's that, that marks those first three chapters. We're seated. We're seated in heavenly places. We're seated in Christ Jesus. And then he says things like this. We looked in chapter 4, those first 17 verses, that we're to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. And then the, the second half of chapter 4, that, that we're to walk in purity. We come into chapter 5. 
We're not to live in fornication. We're not to live in uncleanness, filthiness. We're not to be engaged in coarse jesting. Those are dirty jokes in case you don't know what he's talking about. We're not to engage in those things any longer. He says in beginning in verse 18, he says we're to walk in the Spirit. And then, of course, if you're familiar, and you should be by now, with, with the book of Ephesians. From verse 21 to, to verse 23, he's going to talk about what it means to be a Spirit-filled wife or a Spirit-filled husband. What it means, how we're to live as children. What does it mean to parent as a Christian? What does it mean to work as a Christian? What kind of an employee should we be? What kind of an employer should we be? If we're honest, at least I think. At least I think this. I could be wrong. I may, I may, I, I'm serious. I'm, I could be totally wrong in terms of how you interpret these passages. But I think that most of us interpret these passages as a to-do list. To do this, don't do that, it's a checklist. How am I doing? And some people check it off and feel like, you know, it's a good way of measuring my, my life compared to what the Word says, and others are like, I just don't even want to read it because it convicts me. I just want to continue to living in darkness. And then we get into the last part of chapter 6, from verse 10 to, to verse 20, where Paul talks about the armor of God, that we're to wear this spiritual armor. And I think, see, this, it's just I think, I don't really know what you think, but I think you think. Because I think most Christians in this day and age think, well, that stuff doesn't really apply to me. I mean, I saw The Exorcist and, you know, I, I don't encounter, you know, people spitting pea soup and things like that. So how much spiritual warfare really do I get involved in? So well, how really does, does the spiritual armor apply to me? I don't know what you think, but I think you think that. So most of us, if we deal with that passage at all, the whole armor of God, I think most of us think, well, I guess if I just memorize what those pieces of armor are, I'm okay. And frankly, some of you are probably thinking, he's a little cynical this morning, isn't he? <laughs> no, no, I think, I, I think this is how most of us think very often. Because if we're not careful, most Christians who, who believe the word of God can make the mistake of thinking that as long as I know it, I'm doing okay. But knowing it and doing it are two different things, of course, right? And so then really, what difference does the spiritual armor make? Some of you are thinking, well, what difference does it make this morning? Aren't you supposed to be in chapter 5? Why are you talking about chapter 6? Because they're connected. I don't think that, that Paul's sitting in prison saying, I need to write a checklist for the church in Chalfon. There's a plan he's got. There's a, there's, a, there's, there's a movement of the Spirit in Paul that he would write the things that he's writing here. If only we saw the Bible for what it is. And I, I don't mean that to um, insult anybody's walk with the Lord. I don't mean it that way. What is the Bible? It's God's revelation of his plan to redeem mankind back to himself. Hopefully you know that. When we read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, some of you are thinking, I get it. He just didn't study. That's why he's not teaching Ephesians chapter 5. No, no, no. Uh, there's, there's a place that, that I think we need to go here. When most of us read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we think, oh, creation of everything, how God established marriage and all that. And we get to chapter 3, and we see how the serpent, the devil, how he beguiled Eve, that she would then eat the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was forbidden, and then she gave some to Adam, who knew better. And he ate it too. Fall of man. God's curse that he lays down on the devil, on the woman, on the man. 
And if we're not careful, we can conclude, well, that's done. God took care of that. And he promised that he would send Jesus. Genesis 3.15, that's the first prophecy of the coming of, of the Messiah. It seems sometimes, when I talk to a lot of believers, it seems sometimes that we're missing something. Because we get to the New Testament and we think, okay, Jesus has come, he paid the price for my sin, so as long as I believe that, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. But we have two-thirds of the Bible that at best, much of the church might read and find interesting. At worst, they ignore altogether. Why is it there? Why is all that Old Testament there from Genesis chapter 4 all the way on out to Malachi chapter 4? Why is it there? Well, it shows up when you come to a passage like this because there's a theme that we find in, in this passage that actually is a theme that began all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, and it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a battle between light and darkness, and it's always a battle between light and darkness. The only reason the church can be called the children of light is when those who are the church are the children of light. Just because we enter into a building called a church doesn't make us the children of light. In fact, just because we raise our hand and say, oh, I believe, if we don't really know who he is, we're not the children of light. Oh, this is dangerous stuff. For some of you, you might think, what is he talking about? Well, some stuff happens in Genesis chapter 4 and in Genesis chapter 5 and in Genesis chapter 6. He's not really going to talk about that, is he today? No, but those of you who know Genesis chapter 6 know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's a, it's a theme that comes up there which resonates throughout the entire Bible. In fact, you can't even understand what the gospel really is about without understanding what happens in Genesis chapter 6 and why the flood came in the first place. And that it occurs over and again throughout the Old Testament and will come up again in the last days, the days we're living in right now. How do I know it? Because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. It's a battle, a battle, a raging battle between darkness and light between the one who's called the prince of darkness, who has blinded the mind of the unbelievers, and those who have come, saved by the blood of the Lamb, into the kingdom of light. It's important we understand that, otherwise all we are is card holders in a club called the church. It's really important that we get that. For example, have you ever thought about it when you read you know, John chapter 1, we read that, that the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. We're, we're told that he came, that he was the light. We get this theme of light constantly. Uh, we read in uh, Matthew chapter 4, which is a pickup out of Isaiah chapter 9, that on those living in darkness, a great light has shined. On those living in, the, in darkness, in the land of the shadow of death, a great light has dawned. And to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's not about membership in a club. It's about a battle between light and darkness. It's always that. And if we don't get it, we miss really what most of the Bible is about. In fact, where we end up, if we don't get that, is we come to a checklist. Don't live with your girlfriend, because the Bible says don't do that. Well, no, we shouldn't. Of course not. But some of us leave it there. There's more to the story than that. So he says this, chapter 5. Therefore, be followers or be imitators of God. Have you, have you ever thought of it that way? See, I thought I was just to be going to church. I thought I was supposed to just go to church. No, we're to be 
imitators. That, that's a tough act to follow. Have you ever thought about that? But it's not a suggestion. I didn't ask you to. Uh, you're, you're not supposed to ask me how I'm doing in this. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. We're all in process, I understand, but we're supposed to choose to be in process here. Be imitators, be followers, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even named among you. For it's not fitting as saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather a giving of thanks. For this you know. Did you know this? There's a question. A lot of us don't know what this says here. This you know. We're supposed to know this. No fornicator. Wait, I thought, I thought he's full of grace. Oh, he is. So how far are you going to abuse that is the good question. For no fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Ooh, you see it there? There are the children of love, the children of the Father, and the sons are the children of the disobedient. See that? You always have this battle between light and darkness. What did he say, by the way? That those who choose fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, those who choose to live in filthiness, those who choose to live the duplicitous life, show up in church, do my thing, but I got something cooking on the side. God can't be deceived because he can't be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. This you know, he says, that none of those like that, who continue, who make a lifestyle, that is the point, have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. You might have a membership in a church. You might have a card in the club. But you don't have a membership in the kingdom of God. You're a meddler. No, I just report and you decide. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't be in partnership with people like that. For you were once darkness. See, that's, I know I was. I know I was. And I was saved. See, I didn't just change my behavior. Something happened inside me when I was born again. That's the idea of being born again. See, some of you in here are thinking, Wow, I mean, this is really basic stuff. We all know this. Well, we should all know it, but we don't all know it. And that's the reason I'm grinding through this a little bit. Because it's real easy. And look, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I love to just come and sing. I love it, because I'm worshiping God. So we should do that. But it's real easy to just show up with a group of people and enjoy our time together. Of course we want to do that but we're first of all born again. That's the idea. We're in the kingdom of light now. We were once darkness. I was once darkness. I'm not going to tell you the stuff I did because you have a pretty good idea for yourself. We were once darkness, he says, but now you are light in the Lord. See it? There we go again. Battle between darkness and light. It's not out of the club in the club. Darkness and light. You were once darkness, now you are light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. You see the hypocrisy? There are a lot of Christians, I'm not saying you guys, maybe in the next service, but <laughs> there are a lot of Christians, or a lot of people who call themselves Christians, who live as children of darkness, but call themselves children of light. Paul says you're one or the other. Have you ever noticed that? That's the interesting thing. There's no, I can't go into all that, but it's a great study to do on your own. Light and darkness. What happened? The whole thing, light and darkness are mutually exclusive. 
The moment you turn the light on in the room, the darkness is gone. That's what light does. By the way, that's what you and I are to do when we come into darkness. We shine the light, or we're supposed to. That's the idea. It doesn't mean we start preaching. Our lives are the testimony. That's the idea. And you, you probably know what it's like. You probably have some people you work with or some family members who are like, psh, 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 stop, yeah, I'll tell you later. He's here now. That's okay. Don't be embarrassed. Let it happen. Let it ride. You're supposed to be living at light. Each of us still live as light. There's this, and, and find it, I hope that you find the sensitivity to this, that as you read the Bible, you'll constantly see this idea between darkness, light, darkness, light. It's throughout the Bible. And it's throughout the New Testament, as much as it's, well, probably more so, <laughs> than it is in, in the Old. You were once darkness, now you're light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things, all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you sleeper, arise from the dead, Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil, and therefore don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul says we're to walk circumspectly. It's a great word. I, I love the word. The Greek word is akrobos. You, get, like you think acrobat. I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're an acrobat and you're walking a tightrope, I guarantee you, you are walking very carefully, aren't you? You're walking very carefully. You're not looking at the crowds. You're looking at where you're going because one misstep and you're a dead person. Right? And that's how we're to walk, circumspectly. It's made up of these two ideas, circum, like circle, circumnavigate, right? You know what I mean? The circle, <laughs> look around, spec, how you see. That's how we're to, to, to walk in this world as Christians, as children of light. We're to walk with our eye on the world around us and understand the days that we're living in. We're to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. It's a lot of places to go. But what Paul is saying here, he says in a lot of other places, this idea that we're to walk a certain way, we're to take note of who we are, I could take time this morning, I won't. We're going to do it another time. But just to look around at the world, that's part of the reason we're in Revelation right now, because what's going on is real. And sadly, many Christians don't want to pay attention to what's going on in the world, because we just want to, there's nothing wrong with making a living, we just want to make a living, or we, we're just focused on the things that we think we have to do, and we do, we've got to make a living, we've got to pay the mortgage, we've got to do all those things. But if anybody ought to know, What's really going on in the world, it ought to be the children of light. If anybody knows what's going on in the world, what's going on in our government, and what God's expectations are, it ought to be the children of light, God's children. And so, you know, actually, if you would, in the book of Romans, Paul says this because I think he develops this idea really well over there in chapter 13 of Romans, which is where we're going to be, so you may as well go there. In chapter 13 of Romans, he says this beginning in verse 8. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves, an, uh, who, he who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Agape love is the fulfillment of the law. See, I could take time this morning, and you know, back in Ephesians 5, and I could take each one of those things, like fornication, that's not love. In our society, you know, people who engage in fornication say, I want to make love. That's not love. That's making a mess. That's, that's, that's interfering with another person's life. 
It's, a, it's not just against what God wants. I, you know, it's not a, some people call it puritanical. No, it's wrong because God intended people's bodies to be used in one another's life in only one way. And so in the society we live in today, even Christians are afraid to speak out against transgenderism, to speak out against homosexuality, to speak out against these things that are totally a foul as far as God's plan. In fact, we're afraid to say those things because we'll get kicked off of YouTube. Maybe we will. I hope not. But we have to, we have to call what is what is. And we have to call what is wrong, wrong. Because it's God's, it's God's truth. There is no other truth except that which is God's truth. But I could go through a list of the things that Paul has given us and explain in the context of what he says over in Romans 13 and interpret them in terms of love your neighbor as yourself and show you how wrong those things are. But look what he says here. He says now in verse 11 of chapter 13 of Romans, and do this. Okay, this is what we're to do. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day, meaning the day of Christ, the rapture, that's what he's talking about. The rapture is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Oh, there's that theme again. Darkness and light. Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife, not in envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Paul says it's time to wake up. Time. Not time like, you know, what does the clock say? 10.03. That's not the time. It's not, there's two words. We have one word in English. Of course, you know, the, the Greek is always better than, than English in terms of finding the accurate word, right? So for us, chronos, we, that's, that's 10.03. Kairos is the other word. Now it's the season is the idea. It's the opportunity. It's the opportune time. It's a season. That's the idea. Uh, Dickens, it was, it, was, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. He's not talking 1003, 1004. He's talking about the season. Each one of us is in a season of life, a kairos of life. Paul's saying now it's that kairos. And we need to be aware. Every single one of us, in one regard, we're each in a different kairos of life compared to one another. But we are all, if we're in Christ, actually even if you're not in Christ here this morning, we're all at the same kairos in terms of the world right now. And how close we are, and we are very close to Jesus coming for his church. I believe he could come for us in 2022. I didn't say he's coming for us in 2022. Okay, don't, don't be... Okay, I'm saying... I believe he could be because of the things I see happening. You know, we, we read, you know, Matthew 24 and, 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 you know, the Olivet Discourse in general, things like that, and, and, and Jesus t tells us about the signs of the time. I believe firmly we're living in the time of the signs, that we're living in the time Jesus was talking about, and so we are right there. Sadly, so many in the church have just gotten whatever, you know, jaded or soured and, and, and like, well, whatever, who knows when he's coming back. We're not to live that way as Christians. We're to live expecting his return. And so when we look at what the Bible says and we look at what's happening in the world, I believe that we're living in that kairos, that we're living in that season that he's coming back. And for that reason, it's time. It's that kairos. It's that season for us to wake up. In fact, he says it's high time. Like, it's like the slap across the face, like, wake up, get out of bed, is the point, and start taking, taking stock of what's really happening in the world. He wants us to know the day that we're living in. Jesus said it, Matthew 16. He says, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you religious people, you can look at the sky and say, it's red this evening, it's going to be nice tomorrow, or it's red this morning, it's going to be stormy weather. You can tell the weather, but you can't tell the kairos. You can't tell the season that you're living in. Sadly, that's true of many in the church of Jesus Christ today. We might know our way around a church service, 
We might know our way around parts of the Bible, but we don't take seriously what the Bible tells us about the battle between light and darkness and where we are in this world right now. In fact, Paul says this, you can just keep your place there, but he says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, concerning the times and the kairos, the, concerning the chronos and the kairos, the actual time and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. He's speaking of the world. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. If you're in Jesus Christ, you are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night. We're not of darkness. That's what he says there. And Jesus gives us these signs. He says, when you see these things coming to pass, then look up. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And what's happened to many in the church today is we haven't lifted up our heads. We're not looking for the return of Jesus Christ. We're looking for a change in Washington. We're looking for a change in the stock market. We're looking for a change in these other things that are, it's, they're not, it's not wrong to look for a change in government or a change in the stock market or whatever it may happen to be, but that's not where the solution lies. The solution lies in the kingdom of light. And America is not, by definition, the kingdom of light. As much as I love my country, and I do, this is not the kingdom of light. We're children of light. There's a battle between light and darkness, and it's important for us to, to understand this. Look what Paul says here. Um, I'll read it to you. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit says expressly that in the latter days, some will depart from the faith. He's talking about those in the church. He's not talking about the world, the pagans. He's talking about those in the church. In the latter days, some will depart from the faith and they'll give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Christians will listen to demons, yes. Christians will listen to, to, to deception that comes from the devil himself, yes. And they will speak lies and hypocrisy and having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. When you have a seared conscience, you can do almost anything you want to, at least in your own mind. And you can justify fornication. And you can justify covetousness. And you can justify uncleanness. You can justify all those things because they don't affect you. If you don't have a seared conscience, you have a soft heart. And when those things happen, you're offended. Even when you consider, if I could do that, you're convicted that, no, that's wrong. He says in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. See, some of us read that and say, how quaint. How many kids always been disobedient to parents? Guess what? Not like they are today. Even in my generation. We were far more disobedient than those prior to us. And yet if you compare the concerns that teachers probably had when I was, I mean, I went to grammar school in 1959. That's, that's like ancient for a lot of you, I realize. And for others, it's like, oh, I didn't realize he was that young. Yeah. <laughs> and what were the primary concerns to teachers and principals in, in, in my elementary school? Running in the hall, chewing gum, not sitting in the right seat, those types of things. What are the concerns to, to teachers and principals in, in schools today? It's over the top. You know, we all know that. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of that which is good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Ooh, here's one. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. There's a lot of that even in the church, where there's a form of godliness, but there's a denial of the truth of God, a denial of the battle between light and dark. See, there's a theme here that God wants us to understand. Why should we wake up? He says, because, it's, because for the most part, the church is sleeping. Uh, do you hear me? 
The church is sleeping. How do I know that? Jesus said so. Matthew chapter 25, go and read it for yourself later on today. There's a parable there about 10 virgins. Virgins are a picture of the church. Five are wise, five are foolish. But guess what? They were all doing. They're all sleeping when the bridegroom came. Jesus is our bridegroom. Jesus is coming for the church. Jesus was speaking of the rapture there in Matthew chapter 25. And he said the church would be asleep. Some of those sleeping were wise enough to know that he was coming and they were prepared for when he came. But the others were not. And they were left out of the wedding feast. I want you to just marinate in that because this passage here is important for us to get. It's high time for us to wake up. Why, Paul? Because the church is asleep. The church is asleep today. It's been asleep for a long time. And some are waking up, but the church is asleep, not caring that Jesus is coming. The church has slept through the paganizing of our society, and I'm especially America. The church has slept through immorality, the growth in, in immorality in our society. The, the, has, has, the church has been asleep through the systematic removal of our rights as believers, even together. We haven't experienced it here yet, but it's going to happen. We know it's happening. It's happening in the world, and it's going to happen in America because the Bible tells us that. Why should we wake up? Because our salvation is nearer than it's ever been before. Why should we wake up? Because Jesus is coming soon. Why should we wake up? Well, because the day of the Lord is at hand. It's high time, he says, to wake up. And he says that it's time for us to clean up our act. What does he say there? Again, in, in chapter 13, in verse 12, the night is far spent, the day, meaning the day of Christ is at hand. Therefore, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. He says we're to wake up from our sleep, and we're to clean up our acts, every single one of us, me too. If we're going to live as children of light, we have to wake up, and we've got to clean up our acts. Why? Because he's coming. He's coming. He's coming as a thief in the night. Jesus said, as light shines from the east to the west, bam, suddenly he's going to be here. And he's coming for the bride of Christ. We're to wake up. We're to clean up. He says we're to put on the armor of light. By the way, as, as we get to chapter 6, there you go. That's the idea. Why we're to put on the armor of light. Not just so we walk around showing off how good we are. That's not the point. We're to be ready because as we get closer to the coming of Christ for his bride, the wickedness in our society is boiling, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And everything we think we're used to is nothing compared to what's about to happen. And the only way any one of us in this room will ever endure during that time is to put on that spiritual armor. It'll be weeks before we get to it to study as a church, but I encourage you, go and read it for yourself and start studying it. How do I put on the belt of truth? What does it mean to have the helmet of salvation? What does it mean to have the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, to actually do these things? It's not just a checklist to memorize, but that's how we're to live. He said, and it's time for us, he says, to grow up. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust or in strife or in envy, but to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for the flesh. It's time to wake up. It's time to clean up our acts. It's time to dress up, to put on the armor of light. And frankly, it's time for each one of us to grow up. Some of us have been in Christ a short time. Some of us have been in Christ for a long time. But each of us is accountable to him, not to me. Not to the elders. Not to your wife, not to your husband. To Jesus Christ for where we are in our walk with him we're called to be contenders for the faith Jude says that we're to contend earnestly 
for the faith that was once for all committed to the saints. We're to contend. Of course, pastors are to contend for that. Of course, elders are to contend for that. Of course, Bible teachers are to contend for that. Of course, missionaries are to contend for that. But every single believer in Jesus Christ is to contend for the faith, the faith that was once for all given to the saints. We're to contend for that. We're to take our stand. Contenders contend. To, to contend means to engage in the fight to engage in the discussion, to engage in the battle, whatever it's going to be, we're to engage. We're to be contenders, not pretenders. There's a lot of pretending that goes on that that's called the church, but we're to contend. When Paul says, bringing it back home, because we've got to end here. You know, I could go on all morning. <laughs> I won't. But when Paul says that we're to walk you know, we're to, we're to walk worthy of the calling. We're to walk in love. We're to walk in purity. We're to walk circumspectly, aware of what's going on around us. We're to redeem the time. What does that mean? To buy back. Take stock of the time you have. How much time do you have? Do you, does anybody know how much time you have? No one knows. But I can guarantee you one thing. It's very little. It's a lot less than you think you have. So we're to redeem the time. How do, you, how do you buy time? By not doing one thing and choosing to do another. Because I'm famous for putting off for another time to do certain things that I don't feel comfortable doing right now and, and to engage in the sloppy or to engage in the lazy. I'm famous for that. And a couple of you probably are too. But to redeem the time means to not do that. And instead, to do the thing that I know he's called me to do. Why, he says. Walk circumspectly, redeem the time. Why? Because the days are evil. We're in a battle of light and darkness. And if we would just take a moment, like right now, and ask yourself the question. I'm not, by the way, I'm not judging anybody. Don't be thinking I'm doing that. But just ask yourself in terms of, ask the question, in terms of what I do, with my life, as a spouse, as, as, a, ch as a child, as, as, a, as a parent, as, as an employer, as an employee, and in whatever it is, in what I do for a living, in, in the relationships that I have, where are the areas that I could choose to put off certain things and to redeem the time, walk circumspectly, and do these things instead? I got a feeling each one of us could come up with a list. And that's the Spirit of God saying, now you're cooking. That's what he wants us to look at because we are in a battle. We're engaged in a battle between light and darkness. And so he says that we're to wake up. We're to clean up our acts. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I don't know what you think you're waiting for. But the Bible is clear that those who resist him have one destiny only. And that destiny, that destiny is hell. That destiny is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place that goes on forever. It's, it's, a, it, it's a place that was, was created, incidentally, it was created only for the devil and his demons. So why would anybody go there? And why would God send anyone there? Because he doesn't send anyone there. He allows you to go because you've chosen not to receive Christ, Messiah, Jesus, as the one who paid the price for your sins. Because the Prince of Light has come into this world. Light has dawned on those who are living in darkness. And while the light is still shining, you may come in. There's coming a moment, and it's coming soon, where the light ceases and darkness reigns. You don't want to be left there. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, make your decision today, and then come on up here and, and talk to me or talk to someone in the worship team. The prayer partners will be up here. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today. 
But for the rest of us, do not walk out of here thinking, oh, okay. Because there's something really sober in this passage that, that is it, it, all week long, it's been bugging me. And I, and I understand what it is. It's the, it's the clash of light and darkness that, that the bride of Christ doesn't understand very often and who we are really to be. And he's already equipped us for all that in Christ.